We thank God for church organists who compensate for the late pastor coming down the aisle. Good morning, First Christian Church. It is good to see y'all in worship today. Um, we are grateful for the opportunity to spend time in this space with one another, uh, to be in the presence of God, and to, to be blessed by these few moments to just sit and be with God and with each other. Inside your bulletin, you're going to find things going on in the life of the church, and so I want you to take note of those. There is a women's retreat out at Disciples Crossing, what some of you might know in the former years is the Christian Youth Foundation in Athens, and uh, that is the, toward the end of April, and there's registration information in your bulletin, and you can contact Sharon Gocher if you've got uh, any detailed questions. Uh, we are filling up Easter eggs. Saturday, uh, April 9th, is the Easter extravaganza. Even if you're not a little kid, come see little kids be cute. It will make your weekend. All right, there's going to be a sea of cuteness waiting for the word go to sprint across the church lawn and collect those eggs full of candy, and you're not going to want to miss it. There will also be Ben and Jerry's ice cream and a petting zoo. I've been told that there will be a llama, as there was last year. And so uh, come be a part of that. That's on the 9th from 2 to 4 p.m. outside the Discipleship Center. Uh, you can still make your order for Easter lilies if you'd like to do so. Uh, those can be uh, ordered either online or there's paper forms in the back of the worship space that you can utilize and you can decorate our worship spaces uh, during the uh, Easter Sunday celebration in honor or in memory of somebody in your life. Uh, you're going to notice that I am flying solo today. The Reverend Wright is in Spring, Texas at the Cypress Creek Christian Church. Uh, she is at an ordination service down there. Now, in our tradition, the Christian Church Disciples of Christ, your preachers don't just get to waltz into these jobs. you got to go to four years of college, and then you've got to get a Master of Divinity. It is an 86-credit hour master's degree. It is a whipping, okay? It's horrible. I mean, thank you, Jesus, for this calling. And then uh, after you graduate from that, then you have to go before the Commission on Ministry, multiple meetings in front of this panel, answering their questions, making sure you ain't crazy and you know what you're talking about. And then they say yes. And then you are granted standing as an ordained minister and to complete all of that journey and to bless you and commission you for ministry, we hold ordination services. You've probably come to one at this church if you've gone here too terribly long. They're a big deal, and they are a lot of fun, um, and it is a church commissioning and sending uh, someone off into uh, the wider church to do uh, good work. And so that's where she is today. Now, when that service happens, there's usually a key preacher, a key voice that preaches and leads the service. Now, that preacher is typically a high-profile individual, a seminary professor, a, uh, a regional minister, what some traditions might call a bishop, uh, maybe, maybe the senior pastor from the big steeple in town or in another town, or in this instance, the family life pastor from the First Christian Church in McKinney, Texas, is the preacher at this ordination service. So, next Sunday when she swaggers in here like a big deal, it's because she is. And um, we know her to be a gifted preacher, and I'm glad others do too, and she'll be a blessing to that service. But that's where she is today, and uh, that's a big deal uh, for the uh, individual being ordained and, and for us as well to have a preacher in our ranks who is part of a service in that way. That's enough information sharing for right now. Would you rise and join me in our call to worship? People of the church... Bring your praise to God. Bless the Lord with all that is in you. Take heart that your God is a God of mercy. Bless the Lord with all that is in you. Please remain standing. Our opening hymn this morning is number 15 in your hymnal. It's on the screen as well. Rejoice, you pure in heart. Let's sing to God.
And now, God, in these moments of worship, we turn our attention undividedly toward you. Soften our hearts so that we might more fully absorb the word you have to speak to us. Quiet our minds so that instead of racing and worrying, we find our comfort in your presence. Allow us to bring full praise to you as you wash over this space with your Holy Spirit to bring about all that we need. Hear us as we pray to you the words of your Son, Jesus, that we offer together in one voice. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Church, as you're being seated, I invite our children to come forward for the children's mama with Miss Carla. Good morning. Hi, guys. How are y'all doing today? Good. Awesome. All right, I brought a box of goodies. Okay. What do these all have in common? All recyclable. Recyclable. Okay, Will, what about you? They're all empty. Okay, they're empty, and you're right. They're all things that can be recycled. You know, so that's going to be a caterpillar next week. They're all things that we can throw in the recycle bin. Well, that's good. You know, when we recycle stuff, they break things down, they melt things, and they can make new things out of the recycled stuff, right? Have y'all studied that, learned that a little bit? Yeah, you know, even the cardboard, correct? Okay, they can make something new out of it. Well, you know, um, God kind of recycles us. You think you are recycled, don't you? Okay, well, yeah, he does. You know, he wants us to keep the world clean also. But when, you know, you dedicate your life to Christ, and when you make up those sins, and you ask God, you say, Jesus, please forgive me for my sins, they wash them away, and you're recycled because you're brand new again. So it comes back new again. So next time you throw that Coke can in the recycle bin, thank God for saving you and letting you be recycled. Okay? All right, let's say a quick prayer. Dear God, thank you for these wonderful children today. Wrap your arms around them this week to keep them safe and for them to feel your love. Help them realize how wonderful they really are. These things we ask in your name. Amen. Friends, as we pray together now, want to um, remind you that you can share the things that you would like prayed for um, in a variety of ways. You can reach out to us in the office this week. You can also make use of the prayer tab on the church's website. Now, from time to time, I like to clarify, this is not um, you just like posting out for the whole world to see whatever it is that you type. It's a form that you fill out sharing the things that you'd like prayed for, and then that comes to us in the church office via email. And you get to dictate, do you want that to come to the pastors, to an elder, do you want that to go to our prayer group? And you can rest assured that the things that you have submitted for prayer will be met um, by prayerful spirits uh, that join you in whatever it is that you're carrying and holding before God. Uh, this morning, I want to give a celebratory note at the 9 o'clock service. We, um, we were very happy to dedicate two children, uh, Ben and Anna Wurst, um, who Anna turned five yesterday. It was very exciting. And her younger brother, brother Ben, her, their parents are uh, Greg and Laura Wurst. Um, we first got to know their family when uh, Anna was a student at Crossing Point Christian School, and uh, that led to their family settling in here to worship, to join as members, and now to, to dedicate their children. And so it's very exciting when we get to sort of take those moments uh, to officially covenant in partnership with parents to raise their children in the faith. Um, and again, just like our prayers, that, that stuff with our kids is a team sport here at church. And so uh, take heart that we are having positive impact on the lives of kids in the name of Jesus. I want you to breathe a deep breath and wait in the quiet. And let's pray.
Oh God, we give you thanks that you receive us in whatever shape we come before you. Tired or angry, excited or wondering what is next, ready to take on the world or just hoping the world will slow down for a minute, however it is that we come into your presence. Your heart of compassion is prepared to receive us exactly as we are and to meet our needs. To be for us the comfort for broken hearts, the forgiveness of sin, and equipping us to do good in the world in the name of Jesus, reminding us that we are gifted as your children. And so hold us near to your heart as we come before you this day. In these moments of worship, and these moments of quiet prayer, God, we release before you the things that we have carried for too long, thinking it was our job to be in charge. And we ask for a renewed vigor as we seek your direction, as we call out for your forgiveness, and as we recognize our own call to extend forgiveness. God, breathe life within this church, within its members, within those who walk in the way of Jesus, that we might find ourselves ready to step into a world of need, to be forgiving spirits in the face of sin, to do good for those who are hurting and hungry, lonely and isolated, that we might partner with Jesus to declare the day and moment and year of your favor. We pray for peace where there is war. We pray for comfort for those who are in anguish. God, we pray for the restoration of heart for those who seek to do harm and evil in the world and that you would use the church of Jesus Christ to see that it is so. For the questions that we have that don't seem to yet have answers, give us patience. For those who we love and hurt in ways that we wish we could change, give us continued resilience and compassion. And for each one who gathers this day in the name of Jesus, bless us to hear your voice and to know your nearness and to step out in faith into places we know you are calling us to go. It's in Jesus' name that we gather here in this place to worship, to call upon you, and to bring our voices in praise in his name that we pray. Amen.
Good morning, church. Choir, thank you. And Coretta, where did you go? You're hiding behind. Thank you so much for your leadership with the choir. It is just, it, for the last several months, it has just been such a huge blessing to have the choir back in action and worship. And so for everybody's hard work to make that happen, we, I'm just going to speak for y'all, are very grateful because it's a wonderful addition to our time of worship. <clears throat> Pardon me. This morning we are going to read from the 32nd Psalm. And so hear these words. Happy are those whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Happy are those to whom the Lord imputes no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. While I kept silence, my body wasted away. Through my groaning all day long, for day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you. I did not hide my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgression to the Lord. And you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let all who are faithful offer prayer to you. At the time of distress, the rush of mighty waters shall not reach them. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with glad cries of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Do not be like a horse or a mule without understanding whose temper must be curbed with a bit and a bridle, else it will not stay near you. Many are the torments of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds those who trust in the Lord. Be glad and rejoice. 
and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. <clears throat> the opening two verses of this 32nd Psalm, both sentences begin with the same word, happy. Happy are those whose transgressions are forgiven. Happy are those whose sin has been forgotten. And, you know, happy, you know, I struggle being happy sometimes. Anyone yelled at their car recently? I got a new phone, and my phone and my car will not communicate, and they're supposed to communicate, and while I get it hooked up so that I can make phone calls while I'm driving and not have to hold my phone to my head, but then it won't play the music from my phone. It disconnects one and reconnects the other, and they won't do the same, and it makes me very upset. My life is very hard, everybody. So maybe you've, you know, you've got situations such as that have gotten the best of you, and I wouldn't describe that moment as happy. Driving to church just this morning, I was coming north on Wilson Creek, and it's a two-lane going north, and in both lanes right in front of me, and a 35 were two cars doing about 26 and a half. I gotta get to church. I wasn't happy. And so that word happy is just a little bit difficult to get my head around, but if you dig back into it a little bit, that happy is translated from the Hebrew esher, which most commonly is translated in a lot of where we find in the Old Testament as blessing. We're blessed. Now when it comes out as an emotion, that word is translated emotionally as happy or joyful or fortunate which is not necessarily something that you get. When I think of blessing, you know, we often think of like what we get, what we have, right? Our homes, a good job, a steady income, your family. And while those are blessings for sure, what this language is doing here in, in using happy as this translation from this Hebrew word, it's most commonly used as blessed. Happy, joyful, fortunate. See, those aren't something that you have, those things. There's something that you are. And so the question being answered by the way that the writer is talking about God is not so much, what do I get? But what am I becoming? What's being formed within me? What's being reshaped and, and remade? So, where does this come from? Well, this happiness that starts both of these first two verses of the 32nd Psalm, happy, blessed, fortunate, joyful, this emotional, spiritual response, where does it come from? Happy, joyful, blessed, fortunate are those whose transgressions have been forgiven, whose sins have been washed away, if we know that at the end of the sentence to be true, then we've got to start asking ourselves, what is that knowledge, what is that experience of the forgiveness of sin, the compassionate heart of God, what is that experiencing, experience forging, forming, and reshaping within us? What the writer would tell us is that the consequence of knowing that, the compassionate heart of God, the forgiveness of sin, what we would call the good news of Jesus Christ, the consequence of that, the lived experience and reality of that would be this word blessing, understood as what we are becoming, happy, joyful, fortunate. I mean, really in tune with how significant it is that the love of God made known in Jesus Christ is here to hold us and love us forever, regardless of sin and self-service, and in fact, forgiving sin and self-service. Now, I have some really bad news for you. Now, please don't take this personally, because I'm going to include myself in this. But some of the grumpiest people I ever met are Christians and church people. <laughs> I'm not going to make eye contact with anyone right now. You don't look at me, okay? But some of the grumpiest people in the whole dang world are Christians and church people. Having completely lost sight of the second half, of both of those first two verses 
of the 32nd Psalm. Having completely forgotten about, we might know it intellectually, but it fails sometimes to take root in our heart and soul, the good news of Jesus Christ, the forgiveness of sin, the compassionate heart of God. Now, as your preacher, a lot of times I'll use a lot of the same language over and over again, turns of phrase. And quite often I'll talk about, uh, especially at the communion table, about life now and eternal that we meet in Jesus. Jesus is not waiting for you to die, to do something good and powerful in your life. If eternal life is eternal, shocker, it's already started. And and so we've got to find a way to reconnect the powerful second half of these first two verses, the forgiveness of sin, the compassionate heart of God that holds us and loves us without condition got to reconnect that with sort of the emotional spiritual stirring within us how we see the world how we see one another how we interact with people that are not easy to interact with how do we excel ourselves extend forgiveness now we know how to connect we know how to make these connections between what we know to be true and how it shapes our outward focus on the world Show of hands, who's ever been on a cruise ship? Okay, we've got, we got some, so you have made that exciting walk across the gangway from standing over hard dirt ground onto the floating ocean. You have been there, and you have been that excited person who, who walks across that gangway onto that cruise ship, and unless you're like the very last person, like your flight was late, or your bags were lost, or you got a flat tire on the way, most of, who, most of us who have walked across that gangway and onto that cruise ship, yeah, all right. And like the only bad news is that there is a line at the bar or the buffet. We know how to connect the excitement of that experience with what's going on in our spirit, in our soul, and the outward experience. And, and you, if you've ever been on a, on a ski lift, I have never made faster friends that I have known for almost no time at all. Never see them again in my life. But, oh, man, you get on that ski lift, you start talking. Where'd you come here from? Where's home? What line of work are you in? What runs have you done today? How many days are you skiing this week? Right, and very quickly, right, because we're all having a good time. We're on vacation, and we are ready to just soak up life. Unless, of course, you're a pastor who gets onto a ski lift with like a husband-wife duo and the husband has skied for years and it's the wife's first time and then he didn't ask her where she wanted to go and then like they're not talking and like they wanted you to sit between them and now you've got a council and it's, it's very difficult. We have to talk about active listening and really paying attention to what's being said and making sure we're communicating clearly. Okay, Those people aren't always happy. You ever gone to your favorite sporting event, like if you got a team you follow? There's an energy and a buzz. Now, I'm about to break some bad news to my daughter. I don't like soccer. I'm sorry, Catherine's gone, because we're going to need some counseling after this service. Sorry, babe. Um, And I took her to an FC Dallas soccer game. Match? Game? I don't know. Event? Um, At Toyota Stadium in Frisco. And she was with her soccer team, and the whole team went, and they had a great time, and the first round of the men's basketball tournament was on TV, and so I took my Bluetooth headphones and my phone, and I I watched basketball um, while the game went on. But I'll tell you what, there was a buzz. Even though I really don't know most of the rules, but I do like to go, go! But only do that when someone scored a goal, or they look at you like you're a weirdo. But it sucks you in. There's this buzz. Like, people are thrilled to be there. They know the guys on the team. They know the record of the other team. They're ready to see how this thing's going to play out. They know the cheers. The wave goes on around the stadium. And then there's, like, this vigilante marching band. Because apparently you can just walk into the stadium with a trumpet. I don't know how this works. I feel like there should be metal detectors. I don't know. But there's just this band, and they play music, and there's drums, and it's crazy and right there's this very clear connection between what's going on and the emotional even spiritual response we know how to make these connections and it even sucked me in a little bit even though I had basically no idea what was going on on the field we know how to make those connections 
And so what we've got to work on as Christians, as followers of Jesus, is how are we sort of distancing ourselves from the, the usual grump that can be associated with the Christian faith and church people and begin to posture ourselves in a way that represents more of the joy and blessing and fortune that we know to be true in the gospel of Jesus Christ. People who don't want to go to church, people who are put off by the church and even the Christian faith, they're not put off by churches that are too compassionate. Churches that have just done too much good and the, they fed too many hungry people and it made me mad. No! It's that we are bad at connecting the joy and power and significance of what is true in Jesus Christ with what we're demonstrating out in the world. And then we look crossways at people who walk in without the right attire. Parked in our parking spot, sat in my spot in the sanctuary, didn't know it was time to stand up for the first song, said sins instead of trespasses during the Lord's Prayer. People are not put off by the church and by the Christian faith because we have looked too much like Jesus. Been too excited and joyful and vocal about the compassionate heart of God. That's not putting people off. It's that we too easily forget to bridge the connection between the second half of verses like those first two verses in the 32nd Psalm Blessed, happy, fortunate, joyful are those whose transgressions have been forgiven. That second half ought to stir something within us that makes people want to know what's going on. And so that's kind of our action item as followers of Jesus. It's, honest, it's not enough for us to come sit in this room and share in communion. It's not enough for us to write a check. I still write checks to the church. Uh, I get made fun of by uh, a, a younger than me person who is also a minister at this church, I won't name names, that I still write paper checks. It's not enough. Like in terms of broadening the circle of those who know life with God through the person of Jesus Christ, it has to stir something in us that other people might want something to do with. And so the action item is just this moment-to-moment -moment daily refocus on how do we let the good news of Jesus Christ actually look like good news. And so we've got to distance ourselves from the grump and look at life through a new lens. Because that's, that's how we ultimately connect with people. Right, Because when you get on that cruise ship, you meet somebody. When you sit on that ski lift, right, you make those short-term buddies. That, that connection between the excitement of what we know to be true in this experience, connecting that with our lived, like, outward expression, right, that's how those conversations get started. And so there are people who are desperately longing for some deeper meaning than what they are finding in the world. And if the gospel of Jesus Christ is not coming across from our lives as though there is something good to be had in this news, they're probably not going to care much about it when we invite them to church. So I want you to think about the first time the news felt good. The most recent time the experience of the communion table struck to your heart like, thank God. I want you to think about what it means to matter and belong in Christian community. To be held up by people who support you when life is just a little too difficult on your own. And let's begin to connect the dots. To take the second half of things like those first two verses of this 32nd Psalm. Let that good news actually flow through us. To connect what we know to be true with the externalities of our lives so that in our lives people see a news about Jesus that is good. And my friends, it is good. Amen. 
in just a few moments, we're going to tell the good news to each other as we gather here at the communion table to share intangible items that remind us of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the forgiveness of sin, and the compassionate heart of God. And so as we ready ourselves to receive these elements as a church family, let's bring our voices to God in song. Jesus was gathered with his disciples in an upper room. From the meal that they were eating, he took bread from the table, blessing it. And he gave thanks for it and broke it to pass among those who were gathered as his body broken. Similarly, the cup was shared among those who were gathered with the same blessing upon it as his blood poured out for the forgiveness of sin. And now in the receipt of the elements that we have before us, we acknowledge yet again the invitation and promises of Jesus to know life now and eternal, the forgiveness of sin, and the nearness of the compassionate heart of God. Receive these elements of communion with full hearts. Each week as we worship, we, we share the opportunity to bring before God our gifts, our tithes and offerings. And these financial gifts are not simply because the church has staff and bills to pay, building to upkeep, but rather it is an opportunity for each one of us to take what God has blessed us with and return a portion of that to the work of God 
It is an act of community as we each bring what it is that we have, gather it as one, and ask God to bless it, to do immeasurably more with it than what we do by ourselves. It is an act of relinquishing back to God so that God's work may be done through this church that we love. And so as we collect those gifts in the offering trays, in the back of the worship space, and in our online giving at the church's website, we ask God's blessing upon the gifts that are brought, that they may serve as faithful tokens to do good work in the name of Jesus through this church. To ask that blessing, let's rise and sing our doxology. Our hymn of invitation this morning, our kind of final collective act of worship, is hymn number 545, He Leadeth Me, O Blessed Thought. As we bring these words before God, we begin to shift our attention to what we do here in this place to the world that is waiting for us outside of these walls. We give the invitation that if you would like to join First Christian Church in membership and ministry to live out your faith in Jesus with us here, uh, we want to celebrate that with you and take next steps with that in you. I do hope you will find me or Reverend Wright as we begin that conversation with you. I hope that you will give an invitation to the people in your life to find belonging and significance in what we do here as a church. You're not here because you don't like it. And so invite someone to be a part of it, to share in the joy of Christian life together here at church. Let's bring our words of song before God as we sing, He Leadeth Me.
Church, before we depart, want to do give one uh, important message. This afternoon at 2 p.m. here in the sanctuary, we'll be holding a memorial service for Earl German. Earl and Beverly have been worshiping with us for about a year. She uh, found a Sunday school home in the parlor class, and uh, uh, Earl passed uh, just a couple of weeks ago, and they'll be holding his memorial service here in this space as we honor his life at 2 o'clock this afternoon. So we encourage you to be in prayer for the family and uh, for those that knew and loved Earl. Uh, And we are grateful that at least in the final year of his life, we were able to be a part of that life through our worship together. Friends, as you go from this place under the lordship of Jesus Christ, know that the good news is actually good. Let it restore your soul and instill in you something of joy, something of fortune and blessing. Go from this place under the banner of the lordship of Jesus. Amen.